So hey everyone, this is the fast version of week number nine, lecture number one, which is dealing with movements, and this is the end of the first ex or the second exam. Here are our objectives. So muscles, just as a reminder, there are three different types, smooth, cardiac, and skeletal. What's in common between them all are the contractile proteins, which are actin and myosin. Those are going to be found as part of a structural unit called a sarcomere. Skeletal muscles are multinucleate, and they're going to be the focus of what we're going to look at. They're incapable of division due to the way that they form, and they're actually the fusion of a whole bunch of myocytes during embryonic development. We can replace parts of them using what we call satellite cells, but for the most part, you don't get to replace skeletal muscle once it's lost. We can break the muscular component into these structures called sarcomeres. <clears throat> they consist of a thick filament that's found in the middle, which we can see here in purple. And then you get a hexmer of thin filaments around it, meaning if you have a thick filament here, we'll have six thin filaments around it. They are capable of interacting with each other, and when they do, we refer to this as a cross bridge. So in this figure here, the cross bridges, let's see if I can make this thin enough, turn out to be this. So this interaction and this interaction, those are known as cross bridges. In order to get the cross bridge to exist, calcium ions must be present. So the question then becomes, how do we get that calcium there? This is due to nervous system interaction. So what you need is a motor neuron, so a neuron that's going to be there and cause a muscle traction, to synapse at what's known as the neuromuscular junction. It could also be called a motor end plate or a myoneural junction. The term you use tells you something about you. The neuron is going to release acetylcholine, which is going to bind to a sodium ligand gate. Ligand meaning it needs ACH to bind, and it's then going to open up and allow sodium to move. This will cause depolarization. The depolarization is going to eventually cause the release of calcium ions from the SR, or sarcoplasmic reticulum. That calcium is going to bind to the thin filaments, and the result will be a muscle contraction. We refer to all of this as an excitation contraction coupling. <coughs> so if we get the excitation, we'll get the contraction. The way that we stop this entire process is we use an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, which, was, which will destroy the acetylcholine, which will allow the, the calcium ions be pumped back into the SR. Diagrammatically, here's what we would see. So we have the motor neuron. It's going to secrete ACH, which will bind and trigger the action potential, which are those red lines. The way that you gain access to the SR are these little holes called T-tubules. We get this weird mixture right here of T-tubule SR or, uh, excuse me, SR, T-tubule SR. We call that couple a triad. So as the action potential goes through the T-tubule, it's going to cause the release of calcium ions, as you can see here, from the SR, which will immediately bind to the thin filaments, which you can see down here. And that will allow for the muscle contraction. In particular, the calcium ions bind to a very specific set of proteins found on the thin filament. All of this is the thin filament. The part that we typically care about is the actin, which is the part that will interact with myosin. So this will be the part that will cross bridge. But we have this complex of stuff called troponins. There's three different types of troponins. That's actually where calcium is going to bind, and it moves another protein called tropomyosin, and that will allow for the interaction. 
when muscles contract, what we will see is the sarcomeres physically get shorter. The thick filaments turn out to stay in the same spot, but the thin filaments move. And we refer to this as the sliding filament theory because we see some of the filaments slide and the other ones don't. If I look at this picture here, what we would see is relaxed. We can see that there's a gap between the thin and thick filaments. But as the muscle contracts, this gap gets smaller. And when it's fully contracted, the gap is effectively gone. And that's because we're sliding the thin filaments past the thick. The way that we describe this is in a few steps. First is when we cross bridge, meaning thick and thick, thick and thin filaments interact, myosin and actin are interacting. This is going to cause what's known as a power stroke, which is a contraction. And the sarcomere will shorten. In order to let go and do this again, we add ATP to the myosin. This will, in order to cause the release, we hydrolyze the ATP into ADP and a phosphate. We can reform that cross bridge by removing the last bit of energy. So the full let go and try again uses up an ATP. And then we will redo the power stroke. In terms of pictures, it looks like this. So we have a reset by using ATP. We will make a cross bridge. The moment we cross bridge, we will get a pivot or the power stroke. We will break the power stroke by adding ATP. And we will go through this cycle as many times as we need to, or as long as there's calcium. The other way we could break the cycle is we can run out of ATP, and that's, of course, fatigue. And your muscles actually just lock in place. From beginning to end, motor neuron is going to release acetylcholine across the synapse at the motor end plate. We're going to bind the acetylcholine. It's going to trigger an action potential. That action potential is going to go down the T-tubule, and it's going to trigger the release of calcium ions from the SR. So it's going to be a voltage gate for the calcium. The calcium floods on out. It's going to bind to the thin filament. That's going to allow for cross bridging and a power stroke. We're going to add ATP to reset. And we will keep doing this until we stop releasing calcium. We can control all of this in structures that are known as motor end plates. And this is a ratio of neurons to muscle cells. We call those, of course, motor units, like I said. A small motor unit has a small ratio, meaning a few muscle cells per motor neuron. Large motor units have larger ratios. The smaller the ratio, the better the control, which means more brain power is needed to control this. The larger the motor unit, the less brain power is necessary, the less fine control you get. You also work muscles as antagonists, meaning they are opposites. If you didn't work muscles as opposites, you get jerky motion. So you actually use muscles to fight against each other. And that also happens using motor units. The control of these antagonists are going to be part of the cerebellum. Unlike action potentials, we can actually add up muscle contractions. A single muscle contraction is referred to as a twitch. And twitches are able to add up. Action potentials, on the other hand, cannot. They are one size or they are quantized. So an action potential is an action potential. You don't have a big one or a small one. You just have one. If I have an action potential, I will get a muscle contraction because that is going to be the excitation contraction coupling. However, if I have action potentials in a row, I can add up my contractions, or what we call summation. Eventually, it is possible to have maximum contraction, or what we call tetanus. Tetanus can be fused like this picture, or it can waver at the top. And that has to do with a myriad of factors. Normally, you cannot actually achieve tetanus because your brain stops you. 
When I look at muscle, they don't all act the same. In the dietary world, we refer to this as white meat and dark meat. It is a real thing, and it has to do with mitochondria and the metabolism. We could have muscles that are called fast twitch fibers, which are good for short-term use. Fast twitch can be glycolytic, which means they are good for really fast motion, but they also get really tired really fast, and these are typically white-colored. Oxidative fast twitch are also fast, but they take a little bit longer to tire out. So examples of this would be like your arms versus your chest. Then you could have slow twitch fibers. Slow twitch has to do with endurance. So these are going through lots of aerobic respiration. They take a long time to contract, but also takes them forever to get tired. Think of like your core. Skeleton or skeletal muscles attached to skeletons. So it does help to look at different types of skeletons. We can recognize three major types, even though I show two here. One of them is called an endoskeleton, like what we have. You could also have an exoskeleton where it's on the outside, like arthropods. The job of skeletal muscles are to move joints. And we give them names when you move those joints. The most common is what we call flexion and extension, which is what we're showing in this picture here. So if, you, if you're asked to flex your biceps, you technically can't because the biceps aren't bending. To flex means to decrease an angle. And to extend means to increase an angle. And biceps don't do that. But what you can do is flex an elbow or extend an elbow. And that's how we end up misconstruing these words. Another type of skeleton is referred to as a hydrostatic skeleton. And this doesn't articulate with skeletal muscles, but they use a different type of muscle called smooth muscle to contract. And you get this weird earthworm-like movement. And that earthworm motion is referred to as peristalsis. And you get an odd mixture of circular contraction and long or longitudinal contraction. So we can get it to get bigger and then smaller and then it stretches out and then it contracts. Those are the two main sets of muscles at work. We turn out to use this in our digestive system. So with these hydrostatic skeletons, they don't really make any articulations, but the other skeletons, endo and exo, endo, bones inside, exo, bones outside, they do articulate. And we give those types of joints different types of names, and they vary in their flexibility. For example, we could have a ball and socket joint, like your shoulder or your hip. You could have a hinge joint, like your elbow or your knee. But we could also have pivots, like your neck and actually your forearm, where you can make some twisting motions. Each of these happens to have its advantages, and they have their limitations. Based upon your skeleton and your muscles, that now allows animals to move. And we have three different environments in which animals move. Animals can move through the land. And if you are on land, you need to be strong because you have to fight gravity. If you're in the water, you could be big and you just have to remain floating and you have to shove your way through the water. So you either need to be really big or really small. Or you could be in the air. And if you're in the air, you need to be able to stay in the air. All three of these motions cause different types of problems. So you have to have different body sizes and you need to have different metabolic strategies in order to have the energy to keep going. They all will have different types of circulation patterns. And the result is all of these varieties of motion introduce more options as to how animals are going to function. So when we look more into how animals work, we need to take these three types of motions in consideration because they're going to have different physiological adaptations. Next time, we're going to look at senses. <laughs>